what is a secret that you've kept so well that you, you don't even allow yourself to think about it? If you paused and think that you don't have anything at all like that, I don't think you're thinking hard enough. Why do I say this? Because we're all human. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to share yours, not yet anyway. Instead, I want to talk a little bit about what it was like for me to write an entire book about the secrets that I locked up for over 20 years. In 1994, at seven years old, I moved to New York City from China with my parents. They had been professors back home and I'd always known a fairly privileged life before we moved. I never had to question whether I belonged, whether I had enough to eat, whether I was acceptable. But immediately upon landing at JFK Airport, I learned that one, there was such a thing as being undocumented and that we fell into that category. And two, that there was such a thing as race and our race just happened to be seen as the weakest in America. All this being new to me, I did the only thing at age seven that I knew, and that was to survive, to minimize the risk of attention and thus deportation. Those instructions actually came to me from my father early in our time in New York City. He told me to pretend that I had been born in America, that I had always lived here. Pretend that I was just another normal American kid, whatever that meant, and we would be safe. This was hard at first because I did not even speak English, much less understand American customs or mores like Christmas gift exchanges at school. But as time grew on, it became easier and easier for me to erase my truth that I went to school hungry every day, that I ran from any person in uniform, that my mother had gone from lecturing in a college classroom to working at a sweatshop for three cents per article of clothing. And I learned to live an imagined existence where I was quote unquote normal. And even after we became documented, when we were doing better financially, even years after I graduated from Swarthmore and Yale, I continued to live this lie. Over time, it had become all I knew. And it wasn't until I started to think about writing Beautiful Country, which centers on my childhood and all those years of running and hiding and lying, that I thought about excavating all the secrets that I had hidden. And it was then that I realized that by virtue of keeping those secrets and lying about them, I had buried shame deep inside myself. I had come of age with that shame at the very center of my being. Everything I was had been wrapped around it. And the belief that I had to lie was rooted in the fundamental messages that I lived every day without allowing myself to even acknowledge them. And those messages were, I was bad. I was illegal. I was singularly undeserving. So I had to pretend to be something else. But this pretend, this make-belief, it made it impossible for anyone to get close to me, to know the real me. It was a barrier to all intimacy. And because the dangers of being fully honest were so obvious, I could rarely allow myself to acknowledge my truth, which meant that I could never find a way to accept who I really was. So how did I, after a lifetime of running from the truth, come around to writing a book about it? Well, it began with the very first person with whom I felt safe to share my secret. 
It was a federal judge I worked for after law school. And she was an important judge who decided many big, huge monumental cases, among them appeals from deportation orders. One day I found myself walking into her office and spilling out all of the truths that had been lodged in my throat for over two decades. Now, this is not the excerpt that I plan to read in a little bit, but I do want to read a little bit from the portion of my book that discusses how she responded when she finally heard my truth. The judge removes her reading glasses and looks at me in a way that no adult ever has before. When she speaks, her voice is thick with understanding, slow with certainty. She says many things. They are things I have waited a lifetime to hear, things I have imagined and whispered to myself in the darkness of that little room, my bed too close to mamas and babas, things that I cannot believe are finally before me, mine for the taking. I cannot trust that they are real, and yet I do not question their truth. I simmer in the words, baking in each syllable, as it seasons my spirit. I wrap myself up in the letters, tuck them in all around me. But there is one sentence that stands apart, that puzzles me, that cradles my brain as I lie awake at night. It is what she opens with. She says, as though she knows just how heavy and exhausting it has all been, as sure as she has lived it all herself, the hiding and the running and the lying and the protecting. Secrets, they have so much power, don't they? This passage is the moment that the rest of my life began. That sentence unlocked my freedom. Because as I mulled over that particular sentence for the years to come, I started to understand what that great judgment. We all have secrets that weigh us down. And the belief that we must hide who we are to be acceptable, to be lovable, the belief that we are singularly unworthy that belief is universal. It is actually what connects us, the key to our humanity. And therein lies the beauty of literature, of memoir, and of storytelling. When we allow ourselves to bear our secrets, our fears, our deepest vulnerabilities, to show the times when we acted our very worst and still demonstrate that we found a way to accept even the most unacceptable parts of ourselves. We give power and permission to everyone around us to embrace themselves and their truths. I wanna turn now to reading an excerpt that demonstrates in my book the very difficult chapter for me to write where I reveal the extent of my lying of how secrets got to my very core and show a little bit of the reasons why I chose to act that way. This comes from chapter 21 of my book. That chapter is titled Julie. I became a habitual liar. Alternate lives spewed out of my mouth before circuiting my brain. I started small, but soon advanced to bigger, more extravagant creations. I was born here, I ventured once at the lunch table. A few of my friends grunted in recognition, but none looked up from their hamburgers. That was my gateway drug. My dad is a cop, I tried next. This got a friend's interest. Does he have a gun? Of course, I replied without looking up, donning a mask of cool nonchalance. Sometimes I get to hold it. Where does he work? Can he come to school and show us? He works in Chinatown. It seemed safest 
to go with the only neighborhood I knew well. He's part of the dragon fighters. I had conflated Chinatown's firefighters with its cops, but none of us knew any better. Maybe he can come to school one day, I risked, but he's very busy. I wasn't just talking about these lives. In those moments, I lived them. I was no longer Wang Qian, the bloated girl weighed down with daily worry, the skittering cockroach who turned and walked the opposite way whenever anyone in uniform appeared. In those moments, I was the person who actually deserved the silent awe my friends bestowed upon me at the lunch table with wide, shining eyes. I grew braver with my lies. I'm half white, I declare during another field trip, this time to the Museum of Natural History. Mr. Kane was a big fan of field trips. It meant he didn't have to teach, which was a treat for all of us. Christine didn't respond. I turned to see that she was not enthralled by my makeshift half prestigious heritage, but in instead fixated on the fossils arranged into a triceratops. My dad, he's a white CEO, I said as I examined the tiny arms of the Tyrannosaurus Rex towering over us, careful to hide my exuberance at finally deploying the term I had once heard on TV and earmarked for later use. I thought your dad was a cop, Christine perked up, and we saw him on that trip. He's not white. The problem with Christine was that you never knew when she would be paying attention. Look, Christine, a triceratops in the same room as a T-Rex. That makes no sense. He'll be eaten. I thought your dad was a cop, a Chinese cop. Memory, like an elephant. He, he is. I was just testing you. You passed. Mama grew sicker. When she wasn't in school or at work, she was in bed. We never went window shopping anymore not to the nearby 13th Avenue where we got free samples of sunflower seeds and nuts from the Jewish stores, and certainly not to our favorite area, Herald Square, which had both stores where we could actually shop like Conway and stores we, where we could only dream to one day shop like Macy's. Instead, our outings were to the only Chinese doctors who were safe to visit. Their offices were in their homes, their basements. Mama told me that many of the doctors were hey, like us. They had been doctors in China, just like Mama and Baba had been professors in China, but now none of them could do the things they were good at. Not openly anyway. It was safe this way, Mama said, because they couldn't report us and we couldn't report them. What if they do something wrong, I said, and they make you sicker? She replied with one of those questions that was really an answer. Could it be worse than not seeing a doctor at all? The friend test worked well for me. Anytime I was caught in a lie, I had a way of flipping it and turning it into a gotcha. It gave me control of every situation. My lies grew beyond who I was and where my parents were from. They budded and flowered in even the most banal scenarios. As best friends were required to do, Christina and I always went to the bathroom together using adjacent stalls. If no two adjacent stalls were available, we waited. Who were we to question the rules of friendship? Christine loved to slam the toilet seat down onto the bowl the minute she got into the stall. Because I was always next door, it hurt my ears. But of course, I did not tell her that. Christine, my mom said that if you do that a hundred times, you will go deaf. I've done it thousands of times. I do it every day. I know. I kept my voice measured and calm. I was just testing you. You passed. Sweet. I was smarter than Christine. But she was happier because she celebrated all victories, real or false. We're going to move now to our first writing exercise prompt. Write a, 
about a secret that you hold, something that many, if, if any, well, no, no one um, knows about you. So the next prompt um, for which we will also write for five minutes is write about a time that you told a lie. Why did you lie? And what was the thought or feeling behind that lie? So for this one, write about a time you confessed a secret or a lie. Who did you confide in? And how did that conversation unfold? And how did your relationship with that person progress? Thank you all so much for being here. Th thank you so much, Jan Julie. You are absolutely amazing. Everybody at Girls Right Now is obsessed with your novel, um, with your memoir. Um, and so thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for, you know, sort of putting time aside in your Friday evening. Um, as always, follow us on social and please get your own copy of um, Chan Julie's wonderful novel. So with that, thank you all so much. Have a great night and I hope to see you next time. Bye everybody. Mm -hmm.